Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Diana Bittner of True Women's Health, and we're here tonight for our Let's Chat series to talk about intimate health for women. So we're talking about sexual pleasure or however we want to say this. I sure hope that you're all out there and you're going to participate with me tonight. You're not going to make this sit here and make me sit here and do this by myself. Um, I know this can be a sensitive topic. You might not want other people to see that you're on Facebook Live, but just remember everybody has sex. Everybody has questions about sex. Well, most people. And so you are not alone. And my number one goal of tonight's conversation is to get the conversation going. And my second goal is that we maybe answer some questions. We've had a lot of questions come in beforehand and we were looking at them before we went live and I was just cracking up. You know, sometimes I think, you know, maybe people don't have as many questions because they don't bring it up, but then when they do, it's just clear to me over and over and over again that we all have questions. Um, you know, a couple months ago, I had a patient say, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up and, and you know, I, I just, I love my partner. I'm in a good relationship. I have a good life, you know, I don't feel like I want to have sex anymore. You know, what is that about? Um, you know, is this my life? Is this how it's going to be? So tonight we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about sexual pleasure. We're going to talk about anatomy. Again, this might, you know, be a little sensitive topic for some people. Um, and so if you're, if you're watching this, maybe afterwards, feel free to still send us questions. If you're watching this live, feel free to put a question in perhaps the private message. Our communications team is standing by. And so what they'll do is they'll take your question, they'll put it in either the chat to me or on the basis, but they will not include your name. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask. Again, we wanna keep this light, keep a sense of humor and um, just really, really dive in. You know, it's really interesting because maybe even 15 years ago, for me to think about saying the word orgasm in public, I, it just, it, there's no way I would have thought I would ever do this. But as I learn more and more about women's health, it's thinking about sexual health, not as just an act or an event, but rather sexual health is a, is a part of people's sense of well-being, sense of youth, sense of pleasure. And so I'm learning more and more how important this is to talk about it. So the deal is, is that about 80% of women over their lifetime will have a question about sexual health, 80% of women. So again, you are not alone. As healthcare providers, we know it's an issue, but we kind of hope you don't bring it up because we don't know, necessarily know what to do about it. A lot of us think maybe it takes an hour conversation, maybe we've got to fix everything at once. And in most healthcare systems, providers are limited to 10 or 20 minutes and it's hard to get into this conversation. And so again, you know, we might not even ask about it because we don't know what to do about it. Us healthcare providers, we like to fix stuff. And so when we feel inadequate, then we might not even want to know about it because again, then it makes us feel uncomfortable. Now, again, 80% of women might have questions, but only 10% will ever bring it up to their healthcare provider. And I've done several surveys and focus groups with women talking about sexual health and asking groups of women, like, who do you talk to about sex? Some talk to maybe their sister, um, not often talking to their parents about it. If they do, it's, it's, it's a little more unusual. It's awesome, but you know, it doesn't always happen. Um, some people will talk to their girlfriend. I asked women, how many times do you talk to your partner about sex? And I wasn't surprised, but sad in the sense of, you know, talking to a partner can be so healthy. Um, most women don't even want to talk to their partner about this because it's like, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. So again, tonight, I hope that you leave this conversation, um, with some questions answered and in, even just with some language to talk about it. So I can tell I'm starting to get rambly, so let's maybe get down to it. Um, you know, the first thing is, what is sex? And I'll have patients who will say, you know, um, my husband's had prostate cancer, we can't have penetration anymore, he can't have an erection. I'll say, so what is sex? It's intimacy and it's pleasure. It's something you do with an intimate partner. Um, and hopefully it's very pleasurable. So for example, there's not room for pain and pleasure in the brain at the same time. So again, sex, I hate the word should, but it should be intimate and pleasure. It doesn't have to be maybe what it was when you were 20. 
Um, but hopefully it's way better in the sense is that you know a lot more about yourself, you know more about your partner, you know more about what you want. And again, a really good sex life is about intimacy and pleasure. So there's so much to cover. I might look at my notes here a little bit just to stay on track. But tonight we're going to cover topics, including number one, having the sex life you want. So there are reasons for low sex, low desire, for example, there's at least 27 reasons. And to have the sex life you want, this is one of the main questions people will ask. Another thing we're going to talk about tonight is a topic called HSDD. So HSDD stands for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And some women will say the switch is flipped. I don't care about, you know, um, the roses and flowers and intimacy and privacy or even being on vacation. I just don't care about sex. I don't think about sex. I don't want to have sex, but I want to want to have sex. I remember when it was good. I remember how it was good for our relationship. So HSDD is when that switch flips. And we're going to talk about that in terms of what the options are and to understand what's going on. We're also going to talk about the sex deck. So the sex deck is a tool that I invented. It includes 27 cards, the 27 reasons for low sex drive. So it's a really good conversational tool to get things going, not only A, just to think about um, that for yourself, but also to use this as a tool to help get the discussion going. And if you're interested in getting a sex deck, you can stop by our office in Grand Rapids, or if you're not local, then you can go online and order a sex deck. It's just a really great tool. Um, you know, this every week in the office, we use sex decks all the time to, again, help explain maybe what seems to be this confusing, cloudy topic. So I want to start with knowledge. So when we talk about it, pleasure starts with knowledge. It's knowledge about what one's desires are, how to have good sex, what good sex means, what it means to have an orgasm. Let's talk about all the anatomy of, of um, sexual pleasure. And so the first thing I want to think about with you is your picture of self. So picture of self means how do you want to be in terms of your sexual pleasure, your intimate health. And a picture of self I think about, and at True, we actually will give you a number to, to think about in terms of rating this. So a three for sexual desire means that you have good responsive desire. So if your partner says, hey, you're like, all right, I'm open for that. Maybe not right now, but give me a couple hours. Spontaneous desire is where you just think about sex. So a three means that you want to have good responsive desire. You want to think about sex. You want to have it be an easy, playful conversation with your partner. Or if you're not in a partner relationship, it's an easy thing to think about. It's easy to think about what you might want. So a two is, you know, sex occasionally is good. I might, I know it's not going to be an easy conversation, but as long as I'm having some intimacy, as long as, you know, we're able to, to be sexually active now and then, I'm good with that. You know, then there's a one. There, there are some people who truly aren't having sex, don't care if they have sex. It's okay in the relationship and that's okay. I've had women say, I don't really want to have sex. My partner, like we've been there, done that. We're good without it. Is there anything wrong with me? I'll say, of course not. There's only something wrong if you're not happy with the situation. So then once we ask a patient what she wants, then it's to say, where are you now? So are you in a place where you have a good conversation about sex. You can have sex without pain. You are able to talk about it. Maybe you initiate, maybe your partner initiates at different times, at different places and different locations. Um, but it is happening in a way that's just easy. It's just fun. Isn't that, wouldn't that be a great thing that it's just easy and fun. A two is one initiates or the other initiates, but it's not always the easiest conversation. And, you know, again, it might be not the easiest thing to talk about, and um, but but it's okay, and it, and it doesn't affect the relationship, and and all's good. A one is where, you know, it's it's a it's an awkward conversation. Maybe one person wants it, the other doesn't. There's maybe some arguing about it. It's it's definitely affecting the relationship. So again, let's say you want to be a three. You want it to be easy, and it's not in a good place. Again, that's what we want to talk about tonight. To um, 
to help with this. So in terms of starting this conversation, um, Sam, if you would, let's start with one of the first questions that came in. Again, I feel like I'm rambling a bit. So again, here we're going to get into it. And so this is a question that came in that says, my husband feels like a vibrator is his competition. How can I make him feel less threatened? So one of the things that we'll talk about is I'll ask a, a, I'll ask a patient, are you in the lucky 30? And she'll say, lucky 30, what does that mean? So I'll say only 30% of women can have an orgasm with penetration, with penis and vagina, with penetration, only 30% of women. And some women are just cry with relief because they say, I feel like I've been broken my whole life. I feel like something's been wrong with me. Um, and so if that's the case, and if you want to be able to have an orgasm with penetration or at the same time, let's say that your partner has an orgasm, or it really takes that stimulation on the clitoris to have an orgasm, a vibrator can be really helpful. So actually, if we survey men, and I've only seen the survey done in men, but if the surveys, we survey men without their partners present and we say, does the vibrator bother you? Does Overall, does a vibrator make you feel like, again, it's a competitor or someone else is there in the room? And most men say, no, as long as I get to be there with her when she's doing this, as long as I get to see her have an orgasm. I mean, when else are we as vulnerable? When else are you being as intimate as when you allow someone to watch you or experience that with you? And so for many men, they think it's actually great that that can be part of their sexual experience. And so for this person, I would say, I hear you and I'm so glad that you're talking about it, but could you present it as we're having this experience together? Um, explain the fact that many women can't have an orgasm, that there's nothing wrong with him. It's not his fault that you're not having an orgasm with penetration. It's not his fault. It's just anatomy. It's positions. There are some positions that, that women are able to have an orgasm maybe easier than in other positions. Um, and, and so maybe there's some exploration there. Certainly we can direct you to some references, but, um, for many women, it takes a vibrator to have an orgasm. And so again, it's just having this conversation and say, I just want to be able to have an orgasm with you. Another thing we talk about is, you know, what drives people wanting to have sex together? Is it just the physical release? Is it just the physical pleasure? I would argue it's not. It's people wanting to be wanted. It's wanting to be close to someone. It's wanting to have that connection. So again, it's going back to that and saying, you know, honey, I want to have sex with you. I want to have an orgasm with you. It takes a vibrator. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way it is. So hopefully that helps. And again, feel free to give us a holler, come in and see us at True, and we can talk about this in more detail. So another question. Can you explain the G-spot? Um, is it in a different location for all women? So even at our sexual health society, there's some conversation about, you know, can the G-spot be identified with actual anatomy? So if that area is dissected, if we look for certain nerves all in a little spot together, I wouldn't say that anyone's really found that exact, you know, what is the, the physical description of the G-spot? But most people would understand it as a place of just extreme sensitivity. And it's that ability, some women can even think themselves into an orgasm. And it's an area that feels stimulated in perhaps that G spot. So it's a, it's a collection of nerves that are extra sensitive. And for most women, so our communications team has created this diagram of the clitoris. Um, I just, again, laugh that we're being so, here we are, I hope we don't get in trouble from Facebook. But, but this, is, this is an anatomy um, diagram of the clitoris. So first of all, it's to look at the, the shaft up at the top. And this is covered by a hood of skin that covers the shaft. But the, the clitoris is about almost an inch long in most women. The, the part that most women are you know, familiar with is the glands. It's the very tip of it. So the shaft actually goes up about a whole inch. And then actually the clitoris almost has arms that come down on the inside that still create that sensitivity. So then under that, you see the bulb of the vestibule. So that's just the, the glandular tissue 
uh, the glands that are that are in the around the opening of the vagina. And that yellow tube you see there is where the urine comes out. That's a urethra. You see the vaginal opening is down on the bottom. And for most women, the G spot is a pretty concentrated area just up inside the vaginal opening under the bladder neck. And so this is an area, again, that can be very sensitive for some women, direct stimulation, stimulation with a vibrator or with penetrative sex. It can create a, an orgasm different than perhaps the orgasm on the tip of the clitoris, on the glands, but the G-spot can create certainly pleasure. It can be, um, you know, and, and, and some women will say, well, I don't know if I have a G-spot. So I would say, A, have you explored? Have you understood your anatomy to the point that 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 you're sure? But it it's to maybe use, again, a vibrator or just direct stimulation to know. And for some women, one of the next questions we'll talk about is women ask, is that can women release fluid when they have an orgasm? Can they have essentially an ejaculation? And for many women, it takes stimulation of that G-spot area to have that ejaculation of fluid. And again, staying on the anatomy here, if you look at where the urethra is, where the urine comes out, right above the urethra on either side are two little gland openings called the Skeen's gland. And when a woman releases fluid with an orgasm, again, often stimulated from that G-spot, then fluid releases from those Skeen's glands. And so, yes, it, it can be very common that women release fluid, and it can be something that is associated with that G-spot orgasm. So I guess, guys, we can take the picture down now, but it's so important for women to know their anatomy. The other day, um, it was kind of funny. I had a um, patient at the office and she had heard about me, I don't know, at a wine group or a book club or something. And we were doing the exam and I pulled out the mirror and I put the mirror on her belly and said, you know, we're probably going to need this when we do the exam. And she's like, oh, I heard about the mirror. But the mirror is so important that women understand their anatomy. So first of all, how can you explain your anatomy to your partner if you don't even understand it yourself? And so during the exam, we actually explain the anatomy. And there are many, there are several, if not many, several skin conditions that can cause, for example, pain with sex, such as lichen sclerosis, which we see a lot. Um, for some women, it's that the hood of the clitoris gets stuck down. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. So actually, would you put up the, the anatomy of the clitoris again? So if you look at the glands and then the shaft, over top of that, there's a hood. There's a hood of skin. And so that hood of skin can be pulled back maybe about a half a centimeter, maybe about five millimeters to expose the glands. And something our mothers never taught us is that it can be very important to pull that skin back just as a measure of being clean. So, you know, for example, it's analogous to a guy who's not circumcised. He needs to pull the skin down and clean around in there. So, so it stays clean because the back side of skin makes sebum. What's sebum? So if you've ever had a whitehead pimple, it releases and it stores sebum. It's that white gooey stuff. So skin just makes that. It's just normal stuff, helps with skin lubrication, skin protection. But when the back side of that skin is tucked underneath, what can happen is it makes that sebum. I guess we're good on the picture. We can take it down now. Thanks. And so if, if the um, backside of the skin is making sebum and that skin is trapped, that sebum can be inflammatory, it can create pain. And if it gets stuck down enough and the hood is stuck down enough, then that sebum can actually become firm. We call them epidermal pearls. So it's like this firm little grain of sand under the hood of the clitoris that gets stuck. So as you can imagine, that might not feel so good and could cause definitely pain with sex. And if that hood gets stuck down, it can cause decreased sensation. So recently I had a patient who on exam, yes, I could see that the skin was stuck down. And I said, have you had any change in sensation during sex? And she said, well, actually, yes, but I just thought that it was aging. I thought that it was menopause. I'm like, no, the clitoris will work as long as everything else is healthy. The skin's healthy. And so basically the, the hood was really significantly stuck down. So I applied some topical numbing medicine and we were able to open that up without too much discomfort. And she had a lot of these little white, essentially tiny little grains of sand pearls stuck in there. 
So we got all that out, got the hood opened up, and now she'll just keep that hood open on her own. And I saw her back in follow-up and she said, it's amazing how it's changed sensation. She's able to have a, an orgasm again with penetrative sex. She's able to have an orgasm much easier and the sensation is definitely increased. So again, it's so important to know our anatomy. It's important to know, you know that changes in our anatomy isn't just related to age. So Sam, do you wanna pop another question up? Is there such thing as female ejaculation? Okay, so we talked about that. So again, that's release of fluid from the from the skein's gland when when there's an orgasm. So, oh, then the next thing. So this this made me laugh when I saw this question come in. Is it true that keeping your socks on during sex increases your chance of having an orgasm? This is something I keep seeing on social media and seems silly. So I don't know about keeping the socks on, but what's interesting, for example, that could make sense with this is that. Um, if you've ever noticed that during an orgasm, many people will point their toes. And this is something that Dr. Simon noticed in research, excuse me, and, um, and that, you know, we all talked about. But what happens is the same area in the brain that's stimulated with an orgasm is right close to the motor reflex of the, the lower foot, the toes. And so for many people, they have an orgasm and they point their toes because again, the areas in the brain are stimulated. And so maybe keeping one socks on is related to sensation down on the feet and that helps the, who knows, but it sounds interesting. And so I guess whatever works. So what I wanna talk about now, oh, let's talk about this. So no, go back, it's okay. Is there hope for me to have good sex? I'm 72 and I would say, yes, it. there is hope for you to have good sex. So I wanna tell you a story. So I had a patient, who was 89. So I used to be on live TV a lot talking about all sorts of different topics of women's health. And I had talked about a subject such as this on uh, Fox 17 um, here in West Michigan. And I was talking about female sexual pleasure and orgasm. And um, a patient called the office the next day and she said, um, I want to see Dr. Bittner. And I am 89 years old. I've never had an orgasm in my life, but I want to have one before I die. So she came in to see me, drove up from Kalamazoo and um, did her exam. So she was 89. She was in menopause, of course, and she had not ever been treated for what we call GSM or genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So she had never been treated with vaginal estrogen or let's say interosa that, that works the same and it helps reduce pain with sex and gets the skin back to normal. So she, um, number one, we talked about, are you in the lucky 30? And she said, no, I've had penetrative sex in my life and I have never had an orgasm. I thought I was broken, but you know, it sounds like something I might wanna have before I die. So we use, so I recommended she use vaginal estrogen, which does not go in the blood. It stays right local in the vagina. So she started using a product that I love called Invexi. So she started using Invexi. She got a vibrator. We talked about, again, Lucky 30. We talked about the clitoral stimulation that can be required. And um, she called a couple weeks later. Um, well, maybe it was a month later. It does take a couple weeks for that estrogen to start to work. And um, she was able to have an orgasm. So she called and she was very happy. And I just told her, please, this doesn't mean you have to die yet, you know, that you want to have an orgasm before you died. But but she was very happy that she had um, an orgasm. She then went off to Florida for her winter trip and she met George down in Florida at a trailer park um, where she would stay every every year. And um, <clears throat> she felt very confident that she and George could still, again, have sex. What does that mean? Intimacy and pleasure. And so the next step she wanted to know is how to use a vaginal dilator and how to make things um, not so small down in Lady Town. So, you know, if a woman is 72, again, if she has what we used to call atrophy or if she has symptoms of menopause, dryness, a smaller caliber of the vagina, if um, it hurts to have sex because that skin is so thin, we definitely can help the skin on the outside. If women have sex deep inside, it can mean that the muscles are very tight. So often using a vaginal dilator, which again is not a sex toy. It's a tool to help with a small caliber vagina in terms of to treat the muscle spasm. And also again, to use a medication such as vaginal estrogen like Invexi 
or the vaginal DHEA called Interosa. So again, we have lots of medications. We have lots of options to help women of all ages. So yes, at 72, there still is hope. Now we just have to make sure that um, if you want to have partnered sex, that you have a find a partner who's open to talk about it, whether or not they can still have an erection if you want to have sex with a man, then that's something, that's a whole nother conversation. We know that women over the age of 65, um, not as many women might have spontaneous desire for sex, but those that do, one of the biggest issues is they can't always find a partner who is still, um, shall I say, up for the task. So it's one of those things that we just have to, again, keep our sense of humor about and, and talk about. So what I want to show you is a little bit more about the sex deck. So the sex deck is a way to have a conversation about sex, about libido. And this is uh, the 27 reasons for low sex drive. So I know it's kind of hard to see in the screen, but the cards are color coded. So the orange cards are color coded to represent they, they are the physical reasons for sexual desire. So I had a patient in the office the other day and she said, you know, I just, I have a good relationship. We just don't have sex that much anymore. And I just don't know how to bring up the subject. And I know it's Valentine's day and there's all this pressure, you know, how do we do this? So I said, well, let's go through your cards. So here are the physical cards. So if I put them up a little bit, so one of the cards is incontinence. So of course, if a woman leaks urine or stool during sex, doesn't feel very attractive to want to do that. So on the back are the causes of incontinence and what we can do about it. So again, on each card is what the issue might be, why the issue happens, and then what to do about it. Another one would be low estrogen. So low estrogen can actually affect desire for sex. It can affect one's spontaneous desire, you know, whether or not women just think about sex. And then estrogen can really affect the ability to respond, to have arousal, to have an orgasm. You know, estrogen is really important for that female response. So for women who have low estrogen, you might not know. So again, please ask your healthcare provider, come see us at True. But for women, for example, on a low dose birth control pill, sometimes their estrogen is so low that it can cause painful sex. It can cause low sexual desire. She's 20 years old and she's on the birth control pill. We have many patients who come in at 20 and say, I feel like something's wrong with me. I'm only 20 and I'm not sure that I wanna have sex. So sometimes it's low estrogen, so we deal with that. For some women, it's low testosterone. So how do you know if you have low testosterone? Usually after menopause, your testosterone will drop to 50% of what you used to make. And for some women, you'll notice that. For some women, you don't. So it doesn't mean that all of us have to take testosterone, but testosterone is certainly something that, that we see correlated with low desire. And for some women who take testosterone, we follow the International Menopause Society guidelines and the ISHWISH guidelines and we replace testosterone with FDA approved testosterone called Testim. So again, there's a correlation of low testosterone and low spontaneous desire, maybe even low arousal, uh, maybe less likelihood to have an orgasm. And also we see replacement can improve that in some women, not in everybody, but in some women. Um, so for this patient, she had low estrogen, she had low testosterone. Um, another card is depression or anxiety. So that wasn't one of her cards. Um, physical inactivity, that certainly wasn't one of her cards. She works out five days a week, so that's not an issue. But physical inactivity, if people are just sort of not doing a whole lot anyways, then sometimes that can really affect one's desire for sexual activity. Um, being distracted is a big issue, and this was hard for her. So her parents um, are ill and she's working on moving them locally. Um, she has a, a kid who's really struggling in school um, she's, you know, her job is really stressful and her husband's job is stressful. So of course she's distracted with all this other stuff. And so she's like, the last thing I want to do is have sex. And so unfortunately being intimate with a partner can really help bond. It can keep you feeling close, but if your brain is elsewhere, it really takes intention to have some space from the, all the things of going on in life and just having that time to be intimate and being close to a partner. Um, painful sex is another physical thing. It can be a real issue with wanting to have sex. I have a patient that I saw recently who said, you know, I remember having pain with sex and I just don't even want to go there. Like it takes me a lot to say, okay, fine, let's have sex. But I really worry that um, I'm going to have pain again. So I just don't want to go there. 
Um, hey, Laura, thanks for joining tonight. I'm glad to know I'm not alone here. So thanks. Vaginal dryness can be an issue. So women with vaginal dryness definitely can have um, painful sex. It's hard to get aroused. It just feels dry down there. I had a patient who says, I don't even feel like a girl. It's so dry down there. Um, is this just something I have to live with? So again, no, you don't have to live with it. And on the back is why women have vaginal dryness and then what to do about it. Um, I don't know if we want to take time for all these cards tonight, but chronic pain, a patient who has terrible knee pain, hip pain, she has back pain. Um, another patient with fibromyalgia. Hey, Darlene, thanks for being here too tonight. Um, and great to see you. So chronic pain is a big issue. So when people have chronic pain or physical limitations, that's a big issue. And I have a colleague in the Sexual Health Society, Heather Hodis, who has a website devoted to, let's say, special pillows or special support tools for people with chronic back pain, with arthritis, to still be able to have um, an easier sex life because of physical limitations. So again, let us know and we can um, link you up with that website. For some women, if they have difficulty achieving orgasm, they're like, why do I want to have sex if I can't even have an orgasm, if my partner's not comfortable with a vibrator? So that can be a big deal. And so again, it's something that we want to talk about. And it's something that we want to be able to talk to a woman again, what makes it hard for her to have an orgasm and how can we help her? I had a patient about six months ago who she was going through the menopause transition. She always could have good orgasm. She and her husband had a very comfortable, open sex life. They would talk about it a lot. They really had a good communication. Um, they really had worked through, um, you know, if one wanted it, one didn't, how do we work through that? But, but they had a very active sex life several times a week, which is pretty exceptional. Um, but she said as she went through menopause, she had a lot of difficulty with arousal. So the first thing is we made sure that estrogen was good, testosterone was good. She chose to take hormone medication. She chose to take testosterone but she still had issues. She said, it's not the thunderstorm anymore that it used to be. It's like the pitter patter of raindrops. And I really want that thunderstorm orgasm back. Okay. So then we tried a medicine called Vilesi, which we jokingly call the horny shot, but it can really help increase a woman's spontaneous desire and it can help with sexual pleasure. Um, and we use it to treat hypoactive sexual desire disorder. But for her, it was, you know, would it heighten the ability to have arousal? So off-label use, but for her, she wanted to try it. Didn't really help because she already had great spontaneous desire. So lesson learned on that one. So actually what I did is started off-label Viagra. So for her, having the estrogen, the testosterone, and the off-label off -label Viagra, she was able to use that. She had improved um, arousal and she had the thunderstorm back of an orgasm. So again, it's uh, I'm so pleased that I have colleagues at the International Society for the Women's of S Study for Women's Sexual Health, ISHWISH. And so it has been a really um, a good opportunity for me to learn from my colleagues that if I have a question, I can call them. And if I don't know, I will tell you and we will work together until we figure it out. So um, I saw that, that you're jealous. So let me know. We can talk about that. Fatigue is an issue. I mean, we're all working so hard, long hours, maybe not sleeping so well, especially as women go through the menopause transition that can really affect our sleep. And so it's something that can be a big deal that if you're tired, the last thing you want to do. Um, and so even just talking about sex differences, a lot of times women will say, you know, the, the time that my that my male partner, my husband wants to have sex, it's at night when, are you kidding me? That's the last thing I want to do. So first of all, I'll say there's nothing wrong with a quickie in the morning when everybody's got energy. And we know that when people's cortisol level is high, when they're waking up in the morning, that's when they're most likely to have the best sexual function. So, you know, it's to initiate, it's to have sex when you have the most energy. So again, we talk about that all the time. Let me see if there's any other questions. So you're welcome, Pam. I'm happy to talk about this, especially now that I'm on a roll. It's just, here we are. We're just talking about a good basic human function. Um, Sonia said, thanks for talking about your topics. And again, Kelly, thanks again, you guys, um, for saying that. So medication side effects. We'll get to that question in just two seconds. So medication side effects. Some women will take, for example, an antidepressant like Lexapro. And we use a lot of Lexapro to treat hot flashes, to treat anxiety or 
hormone related mood disturbance. And for a lot of people taking a medication like Lexapro, they still can have good sex, good orgasm, good arousal, it's all good. But for some women that can really reduce their, their chance of having a good orgasm or having um, sexual desire. For other met people, it's let's say a medication for seizures that can decrease sexual desire. So it's really looking at the medication, let's say a beta blocker for blood pressure that can lower um, a woman's ability to have sex or her desire. So again, it's important to look at medications and, and we certainly do that, um, at True. Um, Sam, would you pop up that question that you just had? So this is another question that came in. What brands of lubricants do you recommend? This woman said, I'm really dry and intercourse hurts a lot. I've even bled a few times. So especially for women who have gone through the menopause transition, they're more than five years out from that last menstrual period, it's very common to have very thin skin. And for some women with mild symptoms, all it takes is a good lubricant. So it can be even a couple drops of coconut oil, um, or it could be a lube that we sell at the office, or you can buy it at Target or CVS, um, or even at Meyer if you're in the Midwest. It's called Good Clean Love. So Good Clean Love is an aloe vera based lubricant. Um, it doesn't have any chemicals in it. It's all natural. It's pH balanced. It's not going to irritate your skin. They sell a lubricant that you use on the outside just at the time of, let's say, intercourse. Or they also sell a moisturizer that you can use twice a week up inside the vagina. They sell one that's a, a plain moisturizer and one also that has hyaluronic acid in it, which really can improve the skin's ability to suck up moisture. So, so having a moisturizer twice a week, having a lube, for sex can really help avoid pain with sex. If you have moderate to severe symptoms or where that lube isn't even helping, then, then we recommend something that works better, such as a vaginal estrogen or vaginal DHEA or the Mona Lisa laser. So for women who it's safe to take estrogen, they want to take vaginal estrogen, they're willing to put in a medication twice a week in their vagina or take, let's say, a systemic estrogen, an oral or a patch, then that estrogen is the most effective treatment for um, vaginal dryness and, and painful sex. However, if a woman doesn't want to take estrogen or it's not safe for her to take even vaginal estrogen, then we've got the Mona Lisa laser. And that's true. We offer and we, we use the Mona Lisa laser. If someone's interested, they come in and see Suzanne, our PA, have a consult, see if it's right for you. The Mona Lisa laser, it works. It's as good as estrogen. It's not better, but it's as good as estrogen. And so it's something that we feel really happy that we can provide. So for this woman who has pain, she bleeds, we have a lot of treatment. So this isn't something that women have to suffer from. It is very treatable. Any other questions so far? Oh, here we go. My sex drive is zero. Could testosterone help me? Is there anything that can help? So let's talk about sex drive. So sex drive, there's spontaneous sex drive where you just think about sex. And for some women, they say, I used to have spontaneous sex drive. I used to think about sex, but all of a sudden, you know, it was right at the time of menopause. I just don't think about sex anymore. And so I'll say, okay, that's spontaneous desire. So, and the joke of course, is that guys think about sex every 90 seconds, whether or not that's true. But um, at some point when maybe their testosterone levels fall, then yes, their spontaneous desire might decrease as well responsive desire is where you respond to a cue. Let's say your partner says, hey, and you're like, okay. And once it gets going, it's good. And once you're done, you're like, that was really good. We should do that again. And then tomorrow you're like, eh, you know, I, I, I don't need it every day. But you're able to respond to a cue, such as a song, such as it's Friday night, such as all the kids are gone. So whatever the cue is, whether it's a partner saying, hey, I'd really like to, to be close to you, I'd really like to have sex, or, so again, if your sex drive is zero, your spontaneous desire is zero, then we definitely know that testosterone can help. We know that it can help arousal, and so it also can help that responsive sex drive. Again, there's many women who have sex without taking testosterone, and they do just fine, but for women, this can be a place to start. So especially once we've had the estrogen conversation, then it's time to have the testosterone conversation. Testosterone, again, is something that can help and we replace it for guidelines using a testosterone gel that's FDA approved in men. We don't have any FDA approved top um, uh, testosterone preparations for women. 
hopefully soon the FDA will, will help us change that. But for now, we have an FDA approved product in men that we use at one tenth the dose. So it's just a couple drops every day on the inner thigh. And that definitely can help with sexual desire. We have lots of studies on safety and I feel very comfortable just making sure your blood level stays less than 70. For some women who use maybe the pellets or the compounded, which I do not recommend. So I'll repeat that. I do not recommend compounded or pellet testosterone because again, once that pellet goes in, your level can skyrocket and you're stuck with it for three months. And I've had patients with the pellets who come in and maybe their voice has changed. They're growing extra hair in places they would rather not. And some patients even who have growth of the clitoris where it's growing too big and, um, and it doesn't go back. And so it's one of those things, if you're gonna use testosterone, I would recommend that you see a certified menopause practitioner and you see someone who is following evidence-based guidelines, not the compounded stuff. Again, also when we prescribe testosterone, you get it at the pharmacy, it's only $20 for a packet, which lasts you about four to six weeks. So it's affordable, insurance won't cover it because it's not FDA approved, but, but it is effective and it is very safe. So maybe I'm getting in the weeds a little bit here, but again, I just want you to know that, that there's a lots of, lots of possibilities. Um, I'm looking at Laura's question. The testosterone gel used sparingly doesn't do a lot. So again, it's, it's that testosterone can help with desire, but again, it's also arousal can be an issue. And if there's an issue, let's say with, with, um, even having ADD, you know, if all of a sudden you're starting to think about sex, but then all of a sudden your mind starts thinking about something else, you can have that arousal started and then it's gone. Um, or if you have a little bit of pain, that can also affect arousal or the ability to have an orgasm. So again, it's a puzzle. It's putting all these puzzle pieces together. So again, if you're not in West Michigan and can't see us at True, make sure that you find a certified menopause practitioner. Also of note, I'm part of the Ishwish um, uh, uh, group and we're developing a website for women patients out there to use our website. So it will be a great website called Prasanna and so this website will be available for people to reference articles and information and providers in their area to talk about sexual health. So we're very excited that this website will be out soon and we'll be able to offer more information. Um, and so, and thanks Sonia for, for that comment. Let's go into the sex deck a little bit more. So the next grouping of cards are those that are labeled red. And these cards are all about the reasons for low desire related to psychological reasons. So for example, again, going through the sex deck, I'll ask about job stress. I mean, who doesn't have a little job stress, but it's like how you deal with it. We know, for example, women who do yoga have less distraction. They're able to sort of focus and be present in their body. So let's say job stress is, is an issue. Then of course, sometimes making a job change is, is the thing to do, but resolve difficulties, accept your current Place and just say, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do yoga to deal with it. I'm going to have gratitude to deal with it. So again, it's how do we deal with things that are affecting our low desire? Another one is poor self-image. So for example, we know that for a lot of women over the age of 50, low desire can happen because of maybe not feeling that connection with partner. He's working a ton. I'm working a ton. We're all dealing with a ton of stuff. I can't remember the last time we laughed together. I can't remember the last time we went on a date together and had fun. Yeah, I don't feel real connected. And I've gained 20 pounds. I gained the COVID-20. I just, I just, I'm drinking more wine. I'm eating more stuff. I don't feel good about my shape or my body. Yeah, so I have poor self-image. I don't want to get naked. I'll say, well, do you even, can you look at yourself in the mirror? And they're like, I can't even look at myself in the mirror. Why would I want my partner? So again, I would argue even though, you know, if your partner says, I am still attracted to you, I still find you beautiful, truly believe your partner. They wouldn't say it if they didn't mean it. So it's working on number one, acceptance. And number two, if you want to lose weight, come see Is It True? We have a woman's weight loss program. We can talk about all the, all the options and all the tricks and tips, you know, to help in terms of how do we jumpstart weight loss. But again, it's just to have acceptance and love and gratitude for the body that you have. And then again, talk about that with your partner. I had a patient who said, 
you know, I'm feeling pretty good about my body, but my belly, I hate my belly. I don't like that I've gained weight in my belly and it really bugs me. So I don't want to have sex because I don't want him to see my belly. And I said, well, did you ever just ask him not to touch your belly? Did you ever just say that that bugs you? Because during sex, he would touch her belly and that would remind her that she feels fat and she was done. She didn't want to do it. So she she told him, she said, that's why I don't want to have sex because you touch my belly and it reminds me that I don't feel good about myself. He said, so all I have to do is not touch your belly and you'll have sex. And she's like, yep. And he's like, done. That's, that's good. So again, it's just having this conversation. It's so important to talk about um, what's going on. So history of pain with sex. If you've had pain with sex in the past, of course, it's not going to be something that you might initiate because you're afraid of that. So again, if you have pain with sex, it's a conversation. Those of us who, who take care of women in this phase of life, like this is a comfortable conversation and it's very common that we can help women get rid of most causes of pain with sex. So I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but sometimes I'll joke that there's never been um, a pain that we can't resolve. And at True, we have Kara of iMove who works in our office and she can help with tight pelvic floor. We can treat the skin on the outside. We can treat the skin on the inside um, and then help progressively reintroduce and tell your body's not afraid of sex anymore. So again, lots and lots of options. History of sexual abuse, of course, that's a whole other topic. And often that can take a lot of intensive therapy, but even just talking about it with your partner and saying, you know, this triggers a bad memory, this doesn't, can we just stay in this realm? Can we just have sex this way? Can we have sex with the lights on so I can remember I'm here with you and I'm not thinking about old bad memories? So again, it's just being very common sense, very practical. And again, we have really good trauma-informed therapists that we can refer you to to help resolve some of these you know, old traumas that might lead to you know, current situations. Um, I had a patient again recently with, with this issue and what I said to her was, isn't it sad that you were harmed. I was so sorry that that happened to you, that someone had the power to hurt you. That person does not deserve power to keep affecting your life. No more power. That situation, that person who hurt you does not deserve any more power. So let's take your power back. I get shivers thinking about it. Take your power back and have pleasure now. It doesn't deserve to continue to hurt you. So, you know, Again, we just talk about stuff and really get things in the open and see what we can do. So there's all sorts of psychological reasons. And then there's interpersonal you know, issues. So one is, trying to get this the right distance, insufficient intimacy. So again, when couples are just not connecting, not laughing, not having dates, not staying connected, it can be a big issue. Or if there's just unresolved issues in the relationship. You know, one can just even be poor communication. I had a patient who said, he doesn't know how to help me have an orgasm. So I just like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, have you shown him? Have you guys gotten out a mirror? Have you shown him your anatomy? Have you told him what you like? And she's like, no, I don't want him to feel bad. I don't want him to feel bad that he doesn't already know. I'm like, for God's sakes, how are you ever going to have pleasure together if you don't tell him and talk about anatomy? Tell him what feels good. Tell him what doesn't feel good. And so sometimes there's a game that, that couples can play called, you know, I want you to touch me like this for 10 minutes. So it's just to say, this feels good. This doesn't feel good. And just, again, talk about it. And sometimes, again, just having the sex deck and going through the cards, it makes it, it gets away from the blame game. You can talk about what really is going on versus, you know, it's his fault. It's my fault. All that nonsense. So got to talk about stuff. Lack of a partner, that obviously can be an issue, but it's so important. Um, I do have to laugh. I had a patient who said, um, I need to talk to you about something. And I'm like, okay. And she said, I'm having an affair. I'm like, hmm, yeah, we got to talk about choices. And she said, his name is Bob. I'm like, Bob, she said, battery operated boyfriend. So she wasn't having an affair with another human. She was having an affair. Okay, sorry. But it was pretty funny at the time. But anyways, it's all about, um, you know, if, if you're not, don't have an available partner, what does sexual desire mean to you? What does sexual pleasure mean to you? And again, that can be a whole nother conversation. Lack of trust can be a big buzzkill. So if you don't trust your partner, 
not even just in terms of fidelity, but just don't trust your partner in terms of matters of the heart, matters of the household, how he treats the kids, how she treats the kids, how, so if there's not trust there, it can really affect sexual health and desire. So again, if it's time for counseling, if it's time to talk to a trusted person, if it's time to just, just lay it out there, um, too much time is wasted without conversation. A lack of respect can can kill the sex drive. Lack of attraction. So, you know, there, there's a part of it is is that whole self-image thing. So I had a patient who said, you know, I don't want to hurt my partner's feelings, but he's really let his health go. He's gained a lot of weight. He is not trimming his beard. He is not trimming his nose hairs. Like, ah, like I'm just you know, I wish he would take care of himself. And if he would take care of himself, I feel like I'd be more attracted to him. We'd have more fun again. So it's just like, you know, that's kind of an awkward conversation. How does one have that? But even just pulling out the card and saying, you know, hey, what attracts you about me? This is what I'm attracted to about you. You know, I guess what a great thing to talk about on Valentine's Day, right? But poor communication, again, can be a big desire killer. So we've gone through most of the sex deck. And so again, if this is something that, that you want to um, use, then it can be really helpful. So I'm seeing a comment here. I live in North Carolina. Since watching and learning from Dr. B and True, I'd like to receive some services. So however we can help, um, you know, please just go to the website and check it out. It's truewomenshealth.com. And however we can help, um, we'd be happy to. So, so thanks. We do have people who drive over from the other side of the state. Um, you know, so wherever you are, um, we'd be, we'd be happy to see you. Um, what else have we not talked about? We talked about hormones. We've talked about pain. Um, any other questions before we maybe close for tonight? I can't believe it's almost been an hour. Um, and here I am rattling away, but again, it's such an important topic. Um, again, sexual health is about so much more than an event or pleasure. It's about actually having intimacy and pleasure. And so you do deserve to have the sexual health you want. So I I sure hope that you check out our website. We have lots of blogs. Um, There's actually even, I don't know, Sam, if you can find this, but I did a podcast with Nigel Barker about a year and a half ago um, on his podcast. And, you know, it's just good that, that we're getting out there and we're able to talk about this topic. So you know, please stay tuned. And um, I see one last question here. Is tenderness normal sometimes after menopause? Um, So a whole nother question, but it can be and happy to talk more about that later. And um, you're very welcome for all this uh, information. Um, I so feel grateful that I get to be a part of this community of women who want to know more. um, And we know it's okay to talk about sex. So Thank you so much. Please share this this conversation with your friends um, or those that you don't know if you found this helpful. And again, we just really want to um, all age like we want to. And our next Let's Chat is Take Prevention to Heart. So on February 23rd at 7 p.m., I'm going to talk about heart health. And um, at True, we do a deep dive into people's heart health. Last night at True, we had our uh, first Tuesday talk. So please check those out on our website. But last night we had six people come in and have essentially a group visit with Dr. Egan and Suzanne about heart health. They looked at their heart scores and um, often we order additional tests. For example, the Boston Heart Cholesterol. We can order what's called a coronary artery calcium score. So we'll talk about this more in detail at our next Let's Chat again on February 23rd. So everyone, thank you again for being here tonight. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for being here with me and stay safe. Take care.